Garden Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. As you can probably tell from previous shows, I really do love to garden. Every once in a while I will walk into the vegetable or flower garden and notice a plant that is not a happy camper. Most gardeners have had that same experience at one time or another. So what's going on and what should we do about it? I'm Mary Holm and come along with Prairie Yard and Garden as we visit with someone who can diagnose and help us with our unhappy plants. Anthracnose, botrytis, blight, and powdery mildew are all plant diseases we have heard about and maybe even experienced in our gardens. Today we welcome plant pathologist or plant doctor Michelle Grabowski who can explain these plant diseases and what to do about them. Welcome Michelle. Hi Mary, thanks for having me join you today. It's a pleasure for us to be here with you. Now tell us Michelle, what is your background? Well, as you mentioned, I'm a plant pathologist, which means I'm a plant doctor. So most people don't realize that plants get sick too. Um, there's actually several different organisms that cause disease in plants, including fungi, bacteria, viruses. Um, and what I do is I teach people how to recognize different disease problems in their yards and gardens and help them develop different practices to avoid those diseases in the first place and know what to do if those diseases do show up. So you work with groups, I assume, do you maybe do training with Master Gardeners and other groups too? I do. Um, Master Gardeners are volunteers that work with the University of Minnesota to help home gardeners all across the state uh, deal with plant questions that they have. And so I do a lot of trainings for them to educate them about the different disease problems we're seeing um, and how to deal with them. I also write uh, an article for the Yard and Garden News, which is an online newsletter that Extension puts out. And I also work with commercial vegetable growers here in the state of Minnesota to help them deal with disease problems as well. What are the most common diseases that you see popping up around the state? Well, this time of year, we get a lot of questions about tomatoes. Uh, the tomatoes are ripe, everyone's out looking at their plants, and at the same time they're seeing beautiful red tomatoes, they're seeing some pretty ugly brown leaf spots, and maybe leaves turning completely brown. So we have a couple different types of leaf blights that affect tomatoes here in Minnesota. In a backyard garden, we see septoria leaf spot and early blight. Um, sometimes, if you're lucky, you get both at the same time. Uh, what are some of the things that you recommend for some of these uh, problems that you see? Well, in a home garden, I think prevention is the best medicine. Uh, using cultural control practices to keep diseases at bay and reduce their impact. And I think it's important to realize that we don't grow tomatoes for their lovely green foliage. Uh, we grow them to have ripe tomatoes. And so oftentimes we can tolerate a little bit of leaf blight as long as we keep it at bay until we really get our good tomato crop going. And hopefully we'll be able to talk about and look at some examples of how to do that here today. Why is it so important to know what exactly that you're dealing with before you try to do any remedies? Well, there's lots of different things that can go wrong with a plant. And you want to know exactly what's causing the problem before you try to make a solution, or you may end up heading down the wrong path. Um, there are insects that cause problems in the garden. Uh, spider mites can be an issue. 
We also see uh, fungal pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and all these different organisms have different types of solutions and different strategies that a gardener can use to reduce problems with them. But if you don't know what it is that's causing the problem, it's really difficult, um, and you may end up doing something that's really not helpful at all. So if people need help with diagnosing problems, uh, where can they go for help? Well, there's several different resources available. Um, if you have access to computers and the internet or a smartphone or tablet, um, we do have an online diagnostic tool at University of Minnesota Extension. And what it is, is it's a tool called, what's wrong with my plant? And you need to know some basic things like what's the kind of plant you're looking at and the symptoms you're seeing. Is it spotting on the leaves, wilting of the plant, rotting of the fruit? And then the key will guide you through a series of pictures to help you figure out what's wrong. And it'll lead you to more information about different options to manage that particular problem. And it covers insect problems, disease problems, as well as some of the non-living or abiotic problems like nutrient deficiency that we sometimes see too. Another really good option is find and connect with your local Master Gardener volunteers. Uh, the Master Gardeners are a great group of individuals. They're very knowledgeable and every county is a little unique. Um, some of them have uh, call-in answer lines. Others will be out at farmers markets or at the county fair. So there's a variety of different ways that you can connect with your local Master Gardeners. So if you go to the Extension webpage, you can find your specific county and learn the best ways to connect with that Master Gardener program. Now besides um, problems on tomatoes, what other common things do you see with problems, especially in the vegetable garden? Well, we do see a number of leaf spot diseases um, on just about everything in the garden. Many of our plant pathogens will um, infect plants in the same family. So for example, there's a disease called gray leaf spot that we see and it affects uh, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, and um, some of the early greens like bok choy or joy choy as well. On the peppers, we often see a bacterial leaf spot is very common. Um, on the cucurbits, things like cucumber and squash, there's a number of different leaf spots that we see. We also often see powdery mildew um, on the squash and on the cucumbers. Are there any sprays or powders that you recommend um, or tend to recommend when for specific problems? First of all, fungicides are preventative and protective in nature. So what they're designed to do is keep green plants healthy and green. Once a plant is completely covered with leaf spot, a fungicide is not going to help at all. It's also important to realize that fungicides are effective against fungi. And some of the diseases we see in the garden are caused by bacteria or viruses, or if it's an insect problem, that product's going to be completely ineffective. And so you really do need to start with a proper diagnosis identification of the pest or pathogen, then use your cultural control strategies. And if it is a problem that you've seen year after year and you know that the cultural control strategies are not working, then you can consider a pesticide. Now, if you're choosing a pesticide at the garden center, make sure that even before you buy that product, you read the label carefully. And there's a couple key things you're looking for. You want to make sure that the plant you intend to treat is listed on the label. So if you want to treat your tomato plants, it needs to specifically say tomato. And this is really important because there are products for sale at garden centers that are intended for use on roses and trees and shrubs and plants that are not for human consumption. But if it's something that you're going to eat, then it needs to very specifically be on that label for that particular plant, or it's not going to be safe to eat the vegetables that come off of that plant. Are there any organic um, sprays or products that you can think of to use? Well, the organic products, very similar to a conventional product, you would have to follow the exact same rules. So the plant you're going to treat must be on that label. Um, you must follow all of the instructions when you're using it. And again, you need to make sure that the product you're selecting is going to be effective against the particular pest that you have a problem with, that you're trying to protect against. 
So if it's a, a, a fungicide product um, and your problem is a bacteria, then it doesn't matter if it's organic or conventional, you're not going to get effective control. What are some of the cultural control practices that you recommend to help even prevent problems? Well, um, the most common plant pathogen that causes disease problems are fungi. And both our fungal and our bacterial pathogens love humidity and moisture. Mm. So when we have leaf spot and fruit rot and all this um, these infection above ground, many times those pathogen need moisture or dew on the foliage. And they're often spread by splashing rain or splashing irrigation. So if we know that's what the pathogen likes, we want to create the opposite situation. And so how do we reduce moisture on the foliage and humidity? Um, first of all, if we can switch to drip irrigation or soaker hose, we're going to take uh, splashing irrigation water out of the equation. And so that's very helpful. We can't make it stop raining, um, and we want rain to help nourish our crops. So what we want to do is plant in a way that um, the foliage and the fruit will dry out quickly after a rain event. So we would space our plants um, so that we get good air movement between the plants. We would stake any type of a vining plant, like the tomatoes and the beans, to help them get up above ground so that the air moves around them. I noticed that especially on my tomatoes, a lot of times the problems start on the lower leaves. Can you pick those leaves off in order to, to help slow down the spread of the disease? That's right, and that's a strategy we call sanitation, and it means cleaning up infected plant debris and getting it out of the garden. So many of our leaf spot pathogens, those first infections come from the soil and bounce up to the lower leaves. And you're right, by pruning off those lower leaves, you're getting rid of the fungal infection on those leaves and they would have produced spores that will get splashed to the higher leaves. So you're getting rid of the fungus that's there. You're also creating nice air movement around the base of the plant and a bit of a barrier, a harder space for that fungal to, pathogen to pass from the soil as it moves up to the next layer of leaves. Um, the plant materials that are diseased, can we compost those? So it depends a little bit on the pathogen. Some of our fungi make um, long resting structures that can survive for a long period of time. Um, those we don't want into our compost. Um, luckily, they're less common. We don't see them very often. Many of our powdery mildews, leaf spots, leaf blights, they can go into a compost pile and they'll break down very rapidly, especially if that compost pile heats up. So if you're an active composter, you're turning your pile, you're getting it really hot, then those types of pathogens are going to break down in that compost pile. If your compost pile is a little bit more like my compost pile and it's a cold, slow pile of rot, then you need to understand the pathogens will survive in that plant debris. Can you please um, show us some specific examples of, of some of the problems that you see in the garden? Sure, let's go take a look. So Mary, over here uh, we have one of the most common tomato diseases in Minnesota. This is septoria leaf spot. And if you grow tomatoes in Minnesota, you're bound to see this disease sooner or later. It's, it's very common. Um, it's caused by a fungal pathogen that survives in infected plant debris in the soil. And it splashes up from that plant debris onto the lower leaves. Then each of these little leaf spots, you'll notice, um, will produce their own set of spores. And every time each spot is hit by rain or irrigation, it'll splash new spores to new leaves. And so each season, um, particularly in a really rainy uh, season, we'll get more and more leaf spots every time we get a rain event. Now, the way to recognize this disease, we have very small, dark colored spots on the leaves. They're uh, maybe the size of a pencil tip or even a little bit smaller. And if you look closely, as the spots get older, we get a distinct color break where there's a dark sort of purplish brown uh, border and the center turns gray. And that's pretty characteristic of septoria leaf spot. Now, it doesn't look too bad on this leaf because we still have a lot of green um, that we can see. So this plant still can do a lot of photosynthesis. But what happens is as the disease progresses, the leaves start to turn completely yellow, oh, and it falls right off. Um, so this is actually one of the symptoms is infected leaves will fall to the ground. They first turn yellow after they've become spotted, 
then they turn brown, and then the entire leaflet falls out. And so we end up losing a lot of foliage from the plant. Now, tomatoes can actually tolerate quite a bit of leaf loss. In fact, there's studies showing that a tomato can lose 50% of its leaves before we start losing yield. So it's okay to have a little bit of leaf blight and leaf loss. One of the things that you'll notice here is that although we see some spots here on the stem, none of our fruit have any spots on them. And that is one of the characteristics of this disease is that it infects the green parts of the plant, but it won't infect the fruits on most of our varieties. So these are still completely safe to eat. That's right. The, the tomato fruits are safe to eat, and you can tell that despite having quite a bit of uh, leaf loss and leaf infection, that there's still going to be a pretty good harvest off of these plants. What kind of cultural practices might prevent this type of a disease? Uh, there's a good example over in this other bed. Should we go take a look at it? That would be great. Here are some tomatoes that have been planted with the idea of avoiding disease problems. And there's a couple things that the gardener's done here. Remember we said that many of our fungal leaf spot and leaf blight diseases survive in plant debris in the soil. Well, when rain hits the soil, those spores are splashed up onto our lower foliage. And one way to reduce that from happening is by putting down a nice thick layer of mulch. Um, in this case, they chose to use straw mulch, but you could use wood chip, or there's many fabrics or plastics that are used as well that essentially block the spores in the soil from splashing onto the lower leaves. Now, we also know that our fungal and bacterial pathogens really like moist conditions and humidity. And so plants that are lying on the ground, they're close to the moisture in the soil, there's a lot of humidity down there. But if we can stake them up, and this is a, a pretty si simple system here, they just use some old pipes and uh, some garden twine here um, to tie the plants up, what happens is we get better air movement around the plant. So when we do have a rain event or we have a heavy dew, these leaves have some good air movement around them and are able to dry off quickly, which reduces problems with our fungal leaf spots um, and leaf blights. There's also research showing that plants that are staked, the tomatoes that are staked, um, have fewer problems with fruit rot diseases. So keeping that fruit off of the soil is going to keep them healthier and drier. So something like blossom end rot could poss possibly even be helped by being staked. Now see, there is a case actually where we need to have a good diagnosis. Blossom end rot is not caused by a fungal pathogen or a bacteria. It's a, due to a calcium deficiency in the plant. So it, we call it a rot because that's what it looks like. But what happens is as the tomato plant is creating that fruit, it runs out of ingredients. It needs calcium. And because it doesn't have that calcium, it can't make the end piece of that fruit. And that piece becomes rotten. Now, there is something, though, here that we've done to help with blossom end rot. Oftentimes, it's not uh, a problem because we don't have enough calcium in the soil, but because the plant is having problems taking up that calcium. So things that we can do to help reduce blossom end rot include keeping even soil moisture. And mulch will help keep that soil moist and not have this dry, wet, dry, wet, which causes bursts of growth in the plant and causes problems with blossom end rot. How about on something like herbs, where we actually use the, the foliage um, for uh, our foods and to flavor? Well, that's a, a little bit different strategy because you're right, on the tomatoes, we want healthy fruit. And so you can see with our cultural control practices here that even with these strategies, we have a little bit of disease here. And the cultural control practices are not going to completely eliminate the disease, but they're going to keep them in check so we can still get a harvest and tolerate a little bit of disease. Now, you're right, if we're looking at something um, where we're harvesting the foliage of the plant and that's what we want to eat, then we're going to be able to tolerate a little bit less of the disease problem. And there's some good examples in the herb garden over here if you want to go take a look. That'd be great. So Mary, here we have a patch of mint that has a different type of fungal disease called rust. And you'll notice the top of the leaf 
has pale yellow spots. But often when we're inspecting a plant to figure out what's wrong, we want to make sure we look at both sides of the leaf. And if you flip this leaf over, you see these raised orange pustules. And whenever you see bright orange uh, spore-filled pustules, that's usually a rust fungus. Um, so in this particular case, of course, we'd be harvesting our mint, maybe for a nice tea or to use in our recipes. And uh, this would not be a choice leaf to use. And as the disease progresses, you can see some of the really dried up dead brown leaves, which are not going to be any use to us at all. This plant in particular is very severely infected. Um, and there's not going to be a lot that can be harvested and salvaged out of it. Um, something like uh, mint grows in a very dense group, and so it's hard to reduce the humidity. You could thin it out, you could try to open that canopy up, um, but one option is actually to start out in early in the growing season and look in your seed catalog to determine if there's any resistant varieties. And a resistant variety is going to be resistant to a specific disease. So we know that we're going to have an issue with rust on mint. And so you would want to look for a rust resistant variety. Um, and then when you plant that seed, you're going to have a reduced disease or no disease throughout the growing season due to the genetics of that particular plant. So look for something that a seed or a plant that shows resistance to the problem that you may have. Correct. Now, starting out with healthy seeds and healthy transplants is really important for anything in the vegetable garden. And there's another disease in the basil here that I want to talk to you about. I have a question. I've heard about an apple called snow sweet. Is this a new variety? Yes, this is one of our new varieties, um, snow sweet here. We're still about, oh, maybe three weeks off from its proper ripening time in early October when it should be picked. At that time, it'll be a much larger apple than this. A, a nice, sweet flavored apple. And one of the features it has, kind of one of the reasons it got the name that it did, is because of its snow white flesh color, which actually doesn't turn brown um, when it's cut. So it's another little feature. This tree of, of snow sweet is, a, is a, what's called a dwarf tree. That means it's actually grafted on a dwarfing rootstock. And if we go down below here, we can actually see where the graft union is, um, where the snow sweet scion has been grafted onto the rootstock. And we want to make sure in planting a dwarf apple tree like this that we always keep that graft union above the soil line so that the scion variety does not root. The other thing we want to do with dwarf trees is make sure that we give them a little support. And you can see for this tree that we've actually used a piece of conduit that gives it support, especially through the early years of its life as it's getting established, when it needs some help with higher winds, um, and even some of the weight of all this fruit that we've got on it. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. So Mary, we're here by a beautiful patch of basil. It just smells great. Um, but unfortunately, we're starting to see some symptoms of a, a relatively new disease called basal downy mildew. And this is a pathogen that can easily survive on uh, infected seed, and it comes in on infected transplants. It actually does not survive the winter here in Minnesota, which is great. Um, so when you see it in a garden, um, it can travel long distances on uh, humid conditions, but more often than not what we're seeing is gardeners are planting infected seed or they're purchasing transplants that are already infected with the pathogen. So just to show you what this looks like, if you look at our basil leaf here, you'll notice that there's sections of it are dark green and there's sections that are sort of a pale yellow. And that's where the infection has started. This is the early stages of the infection. And if you flip this over, um, you may or may not see some discoloration here. Um, basil downy mildew does like high humidity. Oh, there's a little bit of gray spores right there. But to really show you guys, if you go to the deeper, more humid parts of the plant here, you'll see that the leaves turn completely yellow. Uh, and of course, no one wants that for their pesto. And when you flip it over, all that gray discoloration underneath 
are the spores of this particular pathogen. And they're easily spread around on the wind, um, but luckily they do not survive the winter here. So the best way to control this disease is to start out with healthy transplants and healthy seed. So we do recommend that gardeners purchase their seed from a reputable supplier. And if you're purchasing transplants, go ahead and do a good inspection of that transplant. And make sure you look at the plant, the upper surface of the leaves, but also flip them over and look at the lower surface of the leaves. As we saw with the downy mildew and with the rust on the mint, there was a lot of fungal growth on the lower surface of the leaf that only looked like discoloration or pale yellowing on the upper surface of the leaf. We also encourage gardeners to look at the stem. The stem should be firm and green, and you should be wary of any kind of discoloration. And most of our transplants are in small pots, so you can actually pull them out and take a look at the roots. And you want nice, white, firm, healthy roots. If you see any kind of discoloration, or there seems to be a lack of a root system, that there's just not very good root development, then that's not a plant that you want to purchase. So start out with healthy seeds and healthy transplants, and it's a great way to get the garden season going. Now, I thought that there was some chard, too, that you had wanted to show us uh, as far as cultural practices. Let's go take a look at that. That sounds great. One strategy to reduce disease during the growing season is to use sanitation. And you'll notice here that our shard has a very common leaf spot known as Cercospora leaf spot. So you've got a purplish red edge with a light colored center. And each one of these leaf spots is full of spore producing structures. So again, we have a fungus that is splashed about by rain and irrigation. Now, shard's a great vegetable to grow because it'll keep going all season and you can keep pulling leaves off of it. But in this case, we have a problem. If you were to go down here, what you'd notice is a whole bunch of leaves that have already been taken out by the disease and you can see some of the leaf spots still in here. So every time we get rain or splash irrigation, it's gonna splash new uh, spores up onto our healthy leaves here. And then these will produce more spores that splash um, onto the rest of the plant. So one simple strategy a gardener can use is to come through on a nice dry day. Again, the spores are, are produced most abundantly when there's moisture on the leaves. So wait until it's dry, Pull out any dead leaves or a leaf that's far enough gone that you know you're not going to be eating it for dinner um, and collect them either in a bucket or a paper bag and you can take them to the compost pile or the municipal compost facility um, to clean them up. And what that's going to do is it's going to help leaves like this, um, which don't have any infection on them, uh, grow to maturity without all this fungal spores splashing around and starting new infections. Well, you have given us just a wealth of wonderful information today. Thank you so much for being on Prairie Yard and Garden. It's been my pleasure. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org.